we now start to look at models of individual change. One very helpful way of understanding the process of change for individuals or groups is the change curve, an oldie but goodie. It is also sometimes referred to as the transition curve, or the coping cycle, or the human response to change. It derives from the work of Kubler-Ross, who observed people in the process of coping with death and bereavement, and it was observed that all change involves the elements of letting go of the past and engaging with a different future. As a result, the patterns she observed offer valuable insights into people facing change. Although some challenged the research, applying this model to organisational situations, it remains a helpful way of looking at change. It is easily communicated and helps to explain many characteristic patterns of response observed in change processes. The curve shows how the personal performance, energy and, characteristically, mood vary through the normal process of human change. The curve begins with shock and denial. After the initial shock, one, of being confronted with change, an individual or group often resists engaging with the change, as if trying to prove that the change is either unreal or unnecessary. This denial phase, two, is characterized by a burst of additional, defensive energy, which tends to increase temporarily both performance and mood. We can help minimize the shock element by effective and early communication. If possible, involve people in the planning process. Once change is announced, be aware of signs that people are not taking it fully seriously, balancing empathy with firmness of resolve. We then move into anger and blame. Assuming the change is real and will continue, there comes a point at which those experiencing the change can no longer avoid engaging with it. At this point, denial often gives way to anger or blame. 3. The idea that it's not fair may take hold. The management, the market, the people in suits, always they are blamed for the change. This is a time for empathy and for helping people to realistically consider the impact changes will have on them individually. Do not try to minimise the losses people will experience. They need to know that the cost of the change to them personally has been well understood. The next stage is bargaining and self-blame. As mood and performance decline further, blame may turn towards self and elements of bargaining emerge. 4. In fear of bereavement, people try to do deals with God to preserve the life of their loved one. Faced with imminent redundancy, people may take on additional work to delay or avert the threat. Personal support and empathy remain important. An effective response will include effective line management, sharing concerns in peer groups, and opportunities to contribute to planning how changes are implemented. I cannot stress how good active listening can be a powerful tool to help people deal with any unwelcome consequences of change. This is followed by depression and confusion. 5. The process to this point has been characterised by a drive to hold on to, or to revert to, the existing or former situation. Energy, morale and performance may fluctuate, but all relate to the downswing side of the curve, between anger, blaming others, and self-blame, bargaining. But the realisation that all such efforts are failing leaves people at their lowest point of performance, energy, and morale. Confusion, sadness, even depression are characteristics of this period. 5. Empathy, active listening, and good support structures are probably the most effective responses to this phase of change. The next stage is acceptance and problem solving. For someone to come through this period requires a point of acceptance. It is a point at which the person accepts at a deep level that change is happening and resolves to address this new future. 6. For significant changes, a person may not reach this point quickly, and in some cases may not reach it at all. But no real future-oriented behaviour will begin until there is true acceptance of what has changed. This insight is like the first light of dawn, by which individuals see that they have a future beyond the change. Following this point, people begin to engage in problem-solving behaviour. 7. How I lived without my loved one. How I can find a new job. How I can configure this new work system to make my life easier. This allows people to try out new approaches, make new discoveries, and eventually to integrate these into their new way of being. 
thinking about the stages that people may go through during change, these are some practical observations for leading and managing change. People sometimes get stuck in one stage or oscillate between two, often around blame. The length and depth of the personal change curve can vary considerably. The change curve is a function of time. Some apparent resistance simply reflects a difference between the position of those announcing a change and those receiving it. People are expressing their own process of adjustment. Do not take anger and blame personally. This pattern of human response to change remains true for the positive changes in life as well as for unwelcome ones. Some factors that tend to affect the length and depth of the personal change curve and the probability of emerging successfully on the upside include the following. How deeply an individual is affected by the change. Therefore, it is critical to understand the change from the perspectives of various stakeholders and stakeholder groups so that the impact on each may be calibrated. We look into this a little bit later. The personal confidence and resilience of the individual. The contribution of supervisors and local line managers is vital, as they are best placed to assess how different people are likely to handle the level of change expected. The interaction between one change and another in the life of an individual. Someone who possesses a stable and strong network of friends and family may cope with redundancy better than another person who is currently undergoing a messy family breakup. Again, if supervisors and line managers know their people well, they can help to assess such impacts. How much control or influence people feel they have over the change? It is a good idea to involve people as early as possible, and as deeply as possible, helping improve the prospects for successful change. This may also go a long way towards explaining the relatively small disturbance that follows positive changes. In many cases, these are changes that we have initiated ourselves and feel more in control of. We must remember the change curve is a personal journey and you cannot expect all members of a peer group to experience change in the manner of synchronized swimmers. Different personalities, different life experiences, different personal circumstances at the time of change, all these and more will affect the way that different individuals respond and how quickly. It is key to remember that based on the above, everyone will go through the change curve at different stages and also that although the stages are in order, Sometimes an individual may move through and then something will take them back again to a different point in the curve. The second of our two models of individual change were developed in the early 1990s by William Bridges in his book Managing Transitions, where Bridges makes a key distinction between change and transition. It is clear from the discussion of the change curve that transition will be a personal process. People will vary as to how quickly they will be ready to let go of the past and truly engage with a new future. Bridges describes three phases, or as he later says, processes, that must be completed for personal transition to be successful. Bridges explains that change is the actual events, activities and steps that can be put into a diary or project plan, and transition is the human, psychological process of letting go of one pattern and engaging with a new one. Letting go of the old ways and the old identity people had this first phase of transition is an ending and the time when you need to help people to deal with their losses. Going through an in-between time when the old is gone but the new isn't fully operational. We call this time the neutral zone. It is when the critical psychological realignments and repatternings take place. The third stage is coming out of transition and making a new beginning. This is when people develop the new identity, experience the new energy and discover the new sense of purpose that makes the change begin to work. It will be clear how closely the transition process mirrors the change curve. It is also helpful to notice two key developments that Bridges' thinking highlights. First, he sets these three phases, not as sequential, but overlapping processes. Each of these stages need attention at the right time to ensure that planned changes are actually implemented by people. These stages are explored in more detail in a moment. Second, he focuses on the creative potential of the neutral zone, not just as a time of confusion and depression, but as a time when there is sufficient fluidity for experimentation, a time when genuinely new attitudes and behaviours can be developed. 
I mentioned we would explore Bridges' stages in a little more detail. And we can do this by looking at the advice he offers to managers and leaders on how to help people through each phase. The principal business of the ending stage is for people to be clear about what particular details of their working life will come to an end because of the change. To let go of something, they must first realize that they are holding on to it. Things to consider, for example, the people in the work process, upstream and downstream, may be different. Communication may be more through clicks on a screen, less by telephone. The location of desks and the community around the coffee may change. These issues and many like them are easily forgotten as we debate change strategies, but each is an ending for those affected. Some, not necessarily all, will feel like losses. The advice offered by Bridges to managers and leaders on how to help people through the process of letting go of the old ways and the old identity would include describing what will be different, i.e. what will and will not change. Acknowledge all losses, large and small. Respect the past. Identify the reasons why the current situation cannot continue. Communicate prodigiously. Obtain valuable input about problems. This is a time we need to think about how people may experience the loss. Also be mindful that the changes we're moving away from, some people may have been influential in making those previous ways of working happen, so it's important to be sensitive. Tip. A good exercise I do is to draw a circle and shade out about three quarters of the circle or what you believe is realistic. Emphasize that the shaded area is what is not changing and the non-shaded area is what is changing. It helps people feel reassured and put into perspective that not everything is changing. Can you think of a change you have been involved in and how you or an organization let go of the past? Some organizations even throw a party, like a wake, depending on how big the change is. Bridges coins the term neutral zone for the time when those affected have let go or made substantial progress on letting go of the way things were. He acknowledges that this in-between time is often difficult, strange, stressful, and disorientating for those affected, but asserts that precisely for these reasons, it opens the possibility of experimentation for developing genuinely new patterns. Think of the neutral zone as a journey from one place to another. The advice offered by Bridges in the neutral zone would include using images or metaphors to give meaning, supporting learning, look for opportunities, Finding temporary solutions, adaptations, and innovations for problems of transition. Encouraging people to connect with other people and teams. Setting up temporary feedback and communication systems. In the new beginning stage, Bridges states that making a new beginning is a risky time. It means committing to a new kind of future. Bridges recommends four things that encourage such commitment. Giving people a purpose, a picture, a plan, and a part to play. Advising leaders and managers on change, Bridges suggests that making new beginnings into reality requires being consistent in behaviour, messages, and decision-making, providing early successes to encourage and reassure people, celebrating key milestones in the change journey, especially the end. The human change wisdom of Bridges brings together many elements of practical advice found in other writers of change and is sound basis for coaching business change leaders on effective approaches. Bridges summarizes his thinking as letting go, repatterning, and making a new beginning. Together, these processes reorient and renew people when things are changing all around them. You need the transition that they add up to for the change to get under the surface of things and affect how people work.